Hello and happy Sabbath to you all. Join us as we discuss the sixth lesson of the fourth quarter from the Teens Cornerstone Lesson 2023. From the orchestra, we have Sid on the piano and Amy on the violin. From the panelists, we have Gideon, Steve, Tatiana, and our wonderful teens teachers. My name is Mikael Fex, and I will be taking you through the mission story. But before we begin, let us have a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day. And Lord, as we discuss the lesson here today, we ask that you and your spirit may come and be with us, O Lord. May you be with the viewers, and may they understand what we are discussing today. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Songs and Soap. That is the name of the story. Now, it was a very special Sabbath in the African country of Cameroon. Actually, it was a very special Sabbath all around the world. You see, it was the third Sabbath of May. Do you know what is so special about the third Sabbath of May? The third Sabbath of May is World Adventurer Day, a day when the adventurers around the world celebrate being adventurers. What does it mean to be an adventurer? Katsia and the other adventurers in her club spent some time thinking about this question. What does it mean to be an adventurer, they wondered. Does it mean reading and memorizing the Bible? Does it mean earning honors? Does it mean gathering for fun activities? They agreed that those were all important things, but there was something that was much greater. They decided that being an adventurer means helping others. It means helping people in need, just as Jesus would if he was walking the earth today. It means being the hands and feet of Jesus. Katia and her friends decided to celebrate World Adventurer Day by visiting children who did not have any parents, orphans. On Sabbath afternoon, Katia and 14 other adventurers went up with a grown-up master guide to the orphanage where 20 orphans lived. The orphans knew that the adventurers were coming, and they eagerly met them in a big room at the orphanage. The adventurers stood on one side of the room and introduced themselves to the orphans. When Katia's turn came, she smiled and said, My name is Katia and I'm nine years old. I am a Seventh-day Adventist and an adventurer. The youngest adventurer was seven years old and the oldest being 11 years old. They all said that they were Adventists and adventurers. Then the orphans introduced themselves the youngest being three years old and the oldest being 18. None of them were Adventists or adventurers, but they were curious to know more about Adventists and adventurers. When the introductions were over, the master guide motioned for the adventurers to stand together. We're going to sing songs with you, he said. Katia and the other adventurers enthusiastically sang songs about Jesus. They clapped their hands and with some songs and made motions with their hands. When the adventurers finished singing a dozen songs, the, advent the orphans asked them to sing again. They had liked what they had and seen. The adventurers sang again the songs and the orphans listened and with bright smiles. Then the master guide preached a short sermon. He told the orphans that even though they didn't have any parents, they had a heavenly father who was always ready to help them. He finished the sermon by praying for the orphans. Then came the moment that Katia had been waiting for. It was time to pass out gifts. Katia and the other adventurers had brought some square bars of soap to give to the orphans. The soap was good for taking baths and washing clothes. The orphans didn't have their own soap, and they sometimes had to take baths and wash their clothes without any. Katia handed two square bars of soap to a six-year-old girl. The little orphan smiled broadly. She was so happy. Thank you, she explained as, the gift, as she accepted the gift. When Katia saw that the girl smiled and, her, her, and had her gratitude, she also felt happy. She was happy that she and the other adventurers had been able to share songs and soap with the orphans. 
After the visit, the master guide took the adventurers to their homes. It was an amazing Sabbath, Katsia said. My wish is to have that experience of helping others and people in need. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a Seventh-day Adventist school in Katsia's home country of Cameroon, where children will learn to help others just like Jesus. Thank you for planning a generous offering next month. Amen. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful item. Welcome to lesson number six, So Long, So. I'd like my fellow panelists to introduce themselves before we begin. You can start from my left. Mm, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Steve, and I'm glad to be here with you all today. Hello, everyone. My name is Tatiana, and I'll be taking you through the lesson. Hey everyone, I'm Gideon, and it's a pleasure to study the lesson with you today. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome all our guests, and um, this is a very interesting story we have here. The title is So Long Soul, and uh, it is a, power, is a story of power gone sour, and uh, we are told here that uh, he began with so much promise. In fact, the Bible describes Saul as one of the people who was good to look at. If you, if you catch my meaning, uh, he was described as someone who was handsome and there's no one in Israel who was as handsome as this guy. And the highlight of the first description of Saul is he was actually humble. Okay? Um, and there, I'd like uh, Tatiana to just read our key text and just tell us um, what she thinks about um, some of the issues that are related with this story. Okay, the key text says the following. 
Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Mm -hmm. He has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. And remember, this is someone who's described as being humble. So what do you guys think? Do you guys agree or disagree with the following statements? The first one is, the root cause of depression is actually selfishness. Tatiana, what do you think? I highly disagree. You highly disagree, Steve? I want to disagree on this one. You want to disagree on that yeah. one? Mm -hmm. Gideon? I also disagree with this. You statement. guys also disagree with that statement, okay. The second one is, mental health and spiritual health are closely related. You guys all agree yes. that that's true? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The third one being, Satan cannot tempt us if we are fully committed to God. Steve, what do you think? Uh, I disagree. You disagree? Yes. What, what are your reasons of disagreeing with this one? The reasons why I disagree with this one is because temptations are there to build us. Okay. They are there to enable us to see the greater good of God. Mm -hmm. And if we are tying it to Jesus Christ himself, remember he was also tempted mm -hmm. and he was God. Mm -hmm. You see, so what, what uh, can limit us humans from getting tempted as well if Christ himself was tempted? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Gideon, what do you think about this statement that Satan cannot tempt us if we are fully committed to God? Being fully committed to God, mm -hmm. I think it puts us in a better position to be targets of temptations by Satan. Mm -hmm. So Satan will actually tempt us more if we are fully committed to God because that's how we get to strengthen our faith in God mm -hmm. and overcoming these temptations mm -hmm. makes us stronger in our faith. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Now the last one, Tatiana, I want you to um, answer me on this or whether you agree or disagree that one of the ways that Satan gains access to our minds is through horoscopes. What do you think? I actually agree. Mm -hmm. And um, Satan actually can't read minds, mm -hmm. but he influences our thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, in this question, one of the ways Satan gains access to our minds is through horoscopes. Horoscopes are, are things that teens, let me say, or people in our age group find very interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is a way that the devil finds to influence us and also gain access to our minds. Okay, amazing. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to contribute on, uh, I think, the third one, where it says that Satan cannot tempt us if we are fully committed to God. I, I disagree with that because temptations will always be there. Um, the only problem is when you give in that temptation. That's where now Satan actually gets you, but temptations will always be there. Now, I just want uh, Gideon to just give us a highlight of what is actually going on in this story, what is happening to Saul. Um, the Bible has described him as someone who was humble and handsome, but what is it that happened to Saul? Gideon, please take it away. So, into the story, our story is about uh, when God sent Saul to the Amalekites and told him to destroy everything. And that, was, that did not quite much happen. Just to read an excerpt from the Into the Story section. Um, Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, Go and completely destroy the weak, those wicked people, the Amalekites, wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why do you not obey the Lord? But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So when Saul was sent to the Amalekites and God instructed him to destroy everything, Saul went ahead and spared their king together with the best of their sheep and cattle. And he took them, 
the cattle were intended to be a sacrifice to God. But Samuel my last soul, uh, isn't it better to obey than to give sacrifice of our trans to God? And we also see in the story that Saul went to visit a medium. Uh, I'll read that paragraph. The Philistines assembled and, the, and came and set camp at Shunem, where Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but he did not answer him by dreams or urim or prophets. But Saul said then to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two other men went to the woman, consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. So Saul went, visited the medium, and later when he's at war with the Philistines, he sees that he is losing the war. So he, so to read from here, Saul said to his armor bearer, draw a sword and run through me, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer, all on this, on, and all his men died together on that same day. So this story starts from the point where Saul visit, visit, is at war with the Amalekites, but instead of killing everything as God instructed, he takes uh, the best of their cattle and sheep and spares their king also. Mm -hmm. So that's disobedience you see right there. Mm -hmm. And we have the section where... Uh, he visits a medium to see to get a foretaste or to just see what will happen at war with the Philistines, and later he also commits suicide at the end of the story. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. I have two big questions for you. The first one is, which I believe you've partly answered, is that what big sin that ultimately contributed to the soul of uh, sorry for, to the demise of King Saul. So the what big, was the ultimate sin? The big sin was Saul's disobedience. Saul's disobedience. Yeah. Thank you very much. I believe that is in order. But I'd want to ask myself, um, why did Saul's sin of keeping some of the animals was almost punished immediately? Yet we have King David, who committed adultery, then later was actually described as a man after God's own heart. Gideon. I believe that David's sin was more of a sin he also recognized and accepted. Mm -hmm. But what is Saul's approach towards his sin? Uh, we are told in the story that uh, when Samuel last Saul, mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, why did you not obey the Lord? Saul says, but I did obey the Lord. Mm -hmm. Saul said, I went on the mission and the, the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back King Agag, the king. So Saul's sin is, he does not accept that he's at fault. Mm -hmm. He does not recognize his sin, mm -hmm. but he goes ahead and says that he obeyed the Lord. Mm -hmm. And even in his disobedience, and it's quite clear that he, was, he did not kill everything. Mm -hmm. He did not destroy everything. He's still, he still, do I say hopeful, mm -hmm. that he's not at fault. But David accepts his sin and tries to tread back towards God's ways. Aye, man, beautiful. Um, now, I have a few questions again now for Tatiana this time around. Um, I have three questions for you. And um, since you read our memory text, um, they can be answered uh, using that. The first one is, and this is probably maybe for um, each and every one of us, you can ask yourself this, have I ever grieved God, and if so, how? Um, yes, I have grieved God. And when we say we grieve God, this is when we give place to the devil and we grieve our Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our tongue actually is a culprit in grieving God's Holy Spirit mm -hmm. where the corrupt vulgar words or angry words we speak. Mm -hmm. I often lash out at people even at home when something is amiss and I planned it. So 
Yes, I do grieve God. Okay, okay. The second one is, does God still turn away from people he has called to leadership? And why? I don't think that God actually turns away from people, mm -hmm. but he does withdraw his spirit. Mm -hmm. We can take that from um, the story of Saul that we read in the, in the story. When actually in the key text it says, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Even so, when um, Saul called out to God and God didn't actually answer, so yes, uh -huh. not really necessarily though. Okay, Steve, you have something to say? Yes, I wanted to add that uh, I believe God has set a framework on what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. see. And uh, he promises that if you abide by, those, by that framework, by that blueprint, that he will be with you, that his spirit will be with you, and that he will guide you all the way. Mm -hmm. And if you look at an example of the book of Kings, Second Kings to be in particular, you find that uh, those kings that followed the framework of God uh, uh, brought change to their kingdom, their kingdoms were, the, their time of their reign were times of peace, mm -hmm. you see. But when we do not follow the framework or we step out of that to follow our own plan, God now tends to withdraw the spirit, as Tatiana said. Mm -hmm. And this causes jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And now this leads to the problems, the various problems that uh, the kings face in the, the reign. Okay. So in other words, it's actually the people that turn away from God. And then when God withdraws his spirit from them, they blame God for turning away from God. That's what I deduce from those two. Now. The other one is, what can I do to safeguard myself from God's withdrawing his spirit from me? Now that Steve has mentioned that there's a certain framework, so what can I do? And probably maybe Steve has answered this and said, there's a framework. So most likely is to live and coordinate within that framework to enable me to establish a relationship whereby God does not withdraw um, his spirit um, from me. Now, um, Steve, yes. I want you to at least identify two people who you know who strike you as persons who might be described as David was described. And you know, David was described as someone mm -hmm. who was after God's own heart. Are there any two people that come to your mind, maybe in the Bible, maybe in your school, mm -hmm. that actually describe, that describe people that were like David? So I believe I can mention Abraham as one of them, mm -hmm. uh, him being the father of faith as well. Mm -hmm. He was able to follow God. He followed God's laws. He, whenever he sinned, mm -hmm. he always turned back to God to look at him. And I believe those are some of the qualities of someone after God's own heart, mm -hmm. that they acknowledge that they've gone wrong. Uh, that they put God as their priority, the first priority, mm -hmm. and that they're able to change their ways mm -hmm. after realizing and acknowledging that they have sinned. Mm -hmm. See, okay. um, another person I can maybe mention, uh, uh, a friend of mine in high school, mm -hmm. he used to be really dedicated to God's word, and whenever he got the chance, he would... Uh, he would uh, go ahead and praise God and do all that. And whenever he was at wrong or whenever told, someone told him he was at fault, mm -hmm. he was very quick to realize that and to change his ways. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the uh, qualities I found desirable in him. Uh, great. Yeah. Now, um, what I get from you is that just being described as someone who's after God's own heart does not necessarily mean you'll be faultless. But it much more means that you are able to recognize um, your fault and actually go back to God in genuine repentance. Because you know even Judas repented, but, but you see his repentance was false. He was just guilty of the sin, but he didn't have like genuine repentance. So thank you very much, Steve, for that. Now, um, Gideon, I want you to, to think about the steps that led to Saul's downfall. And I just want you to probably maybe give us the punchlines that 
stood out for you um, in this story? What are some of the key texts that uh, you relate with Saul's downfall that act as a beacon of warning to, to us and, and, and to the world as general? So I'll pick two. Deuteronomy 12, 18 and 1 Timothy 4. So Deuteronomy 12, 18 says, be careful to obey all these regulations I am giving you so that it may always go well with you and your children after you because you will be doing what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord, your God. And 1 Timothy 4, 1, the Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So, First Timothy 4 and stands as a one because we are told that um, in, time, in later times, some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And I think that's something that's actually quite evident today, mm -hmm. that some people are just foregoing or abandoning their faith and they're following whatever way they find right, in mm -hmm. their own ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in other words, you can start well, but not, not end well. Yeah. And that's, uh, I think, the saddest thing about, uh, about soul here. That, you see, um, starting well is not enough. It's not enough to just get comfortable just because you have started well. Tatiana, what do you think? What's your favorite text here? That's a beacon of warning. Um, I'd go with First Chronicles ten, thirteen, verse fourteen and fourteen, and it says, mm -hmm. "Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord, and even consulted a medium for guidance, and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David's son of Jesse." Mm -hmm. Here, even the Lord says, "Oh, sorry." Um, he was unfaithful to the Lord, and he even goes to the extent of putting things in his own hands and consulting a median instead of going to God directly. And this is what put him to death and even turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are seeing here, first, I think one of the things I got from this story is that Saul actually battled mental illness. Okay. And um, he also developed pathological hatred for, for David and he even tried to, to kill him. And, and this just basically tells us that this guy who started out well as a humble servant of the Lord, he veered off the road, okay? And it was so difficult for him to get back on track. So this led him to another sin, which now he started to become jealous of, of David. Um, you remember people were singing um, that Saul has killed just thousands and David has killed 10,000. And he became jealous of, of David. And you see, initially, all these blessings that David received were to be in place for him. So if he were to be faithful, the same praises that David received were actually um, conferred to him um, at first. Now, uh, Steve, you want okay. to add something? Yes. So, in line with what you mentioned about uh, Saul starting well but not ending well, uh, a particular punchline stood out to me that, mentioned, that says, this is from Mark chapter 14, verse 38. It says that, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, you will find that, you might even find that Saul himself wanted to glorify God, wanted his reign to be one of peace, one of uh, where God was the focal point, see. But uh, I guess he, he got comfortable mm -hmm. and uh, maybe did not consult God as much. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll find that he may have fallen off because of that mm -hmm. and he got all these issues of the mental illness like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So this can be a lesson that we should persevere in prayer, always consult God so that uh, whenever the times of trials come, we do not fall short. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Now, um, I have a question for you. Yes. Which ditch I am, am I more inclined to fall into? 
And uh, you can answer that by giving us what C.S. Lewis wrote and also um, Jibs 219 can help you answer that. Which ditch is this that am I likely to fall into? So uh, if I can read from here, uh, as Lewis wrote, that there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So this describes how some people view things like spirits and demons. The fact that some of them view it as that they don't exist and that they don't have an influence over their lives. And some believe in them excessively, too much. You see, one thing we have to put straight here is that they do exist, you see. And they do play some factor in what we do, in the decisions we make, and in the trajectory of our lives. You see. And many people, uh, according to my point of view, they tend to fall in a uh, side where they don't believe that they exist, you see. And so when something happens to them, they cannot attribute it to maybe something like of that sort happening, you see. And the point is to find a middle ground mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. so as not to fall into one of those ditches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, I think one, one of the primary uh, reasons for Saul's demise was actually selfishness. Okay. And uh, you see, we are told that see, selfishness must be overcome. You must be overcome self. Um, I believe there's a time I was listening to a certain preacher, and um, he was just trying to ask a question, and they asked, um, who is your worst enemy? Like, who is the enemy when even the, their name comes about, you can even frown? And um, many people give various answers, but the preacher student said, your worst enemy is actually yourself. And they said, the day you will actually overcome self, you will have gained a lot of victories. And the other person also said that, um, you know, the greatest battles, uh, greater than the battle that has even been fought in Israel and Palestine right now, the greatest battle that will, was ever fought is the battle in your mind. Saul had a battle here. Unfortunately, he succumbed. And of course, all these things were written for our ensembles. Okay? They were written so that we might see and be able to discern the, the things that have happened in the past so that we may be able to align our lives to that which um, is right and true. How can I become more selfless is the question. We've, we've discovered that, you know, selfishness can take you down. How do you become selfless? What are some of the activities you have to participate in to actually overcome being selfish? Tatiana, you want to start? Um, yes. Mm. I think the best answer for that would be calling upon the Lord and acknowledging his presence. Mm. In everything that we do, we're always going to need God. Mm -hmm. Gideon, what's the best method to overcome selfishness? I think the best method to overcome selfishness is uh, putting other people's will first. Mm. I mean, that's the literal defi definition of selflessness. But when you think about what someone feels or how someone will react to something, it definitely gives you a hand in being selfless. And I'd also agree with Tatiana where she says that putting God first also. Putting God first. Steve, how can one actually overcome being selfish? Uh, I can say humility. Humility? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because humility is the state of knowing that you are capable of doing such things, mm. knowing that you are able to do much, but putting yourself in a position where it's not mm. overshadowing the fact that God reigns over you, that mm. God exists, and is the one who controls your life. Mm. So I believe humility as being one of the main ways we can prevent mm. selflessness. Mm. We can achieve selflessness. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for that. Um, I want us to conclude, and uh, as we conclude, um, I want you guys to just give me what you take away from, from
from this story. Um, I'd like to start from Gideon. You can just tell me um, what you take away from this story? My take home for this, from this story would be that no, we might have started well, but that does not guarantee us a good ending. Soul was Soul started well. Soul was God's own cho was God's chosen one for king of Israel. But when he became disobedient and started following his own ways, in what I would refer to as scorn, he was quite scornful. He he started treading away from God. And once he started treading away from God, it was a direct path towards the exit that he followed, of which he could still have turned back, but he's the, taking the first leap towards stepping away from God's kingdom just led him completely out. Thank you very much. Tatiana? Um, the most important thing I, thing I took from this story is that we should not be selfless. And also that uh, having God in our lives is what keeps us going. And also that we should obey God's commandments. And when you sin, it's good to repent and to know of your wrongdoings. Steve? Uh, what I'll take away from this is that God has a standpoint in your life. And in whatever you do, in wherever you go, you should acknowledge that standpoint. That's where the aspect of putting God first comes in. Mm -hmm. And so we should uh, aspire to take this seriously and consult God whenever we want to make decisions or we want to do things in our life. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think what I take away personally from this story is, um, number one, I think selfishness is a sin that is practiced to the most. And it's the one that, uh, you know, creates so many spiritual disorders we have is mental illnesses, like Saul was technically mentally ill. And the other lesson I take away is that there is no man who can stand upon a lofty uh, position without danger. Um, some philosopher who normally says that it is the glass that is full that is hard to balance. Well, the one that is half empty is easier to balance, but the glass that is full is actually hard to balance. So even in the future as young people, when you may be uh, given positions of power and authority. Ever remember that that's the most dangerous position that you can ever be in. And um, it's not for you, for you to be scared, but it is actually for you to depend on God in decision making in such lofty positions. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, until next time, Kwaheri. Mighty Father, what in heaven, thank you for the lessons that we've learned from the life of soul. Lord, how I pray that you may be able to help us, Lord, as young people, Lord, as we um, take on life, we may be entrusted with um, positions of trust. Lord, how I pray that we may learn the lessons and take homes that we may be able to stand, even in the midst of trials, to still depend on you. Be with us, for it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.